Hi, everyone. Welcome to our program today at ULI. Uh, as people begin to trickle in to listen to Neighbourhoods for the Future, confronting the post-pandemic global urban challenge, would like to begin by playing the ULI video as, uh, as an introduction. So if everyone can just um, listen in and we'll just wait for more participants to come in, we will begin with an introductory video about ULI. One of the staff members at ULI Toronto came to speak at Ryerson University and I just thought you know this is a great way to network and to meet people and to learn more about my city as well because they put on such great programming. To me ULI has been a crucial part of my career development. Four years ago in Kensington Market uh, there was a ULI walking tour where I met a senior city planner and uh, we developed a strong working relationship. That's the great thing about ULI is the opportunity to be uh, with like-minded people in, uh, in the industry. I've personally hired people from running into them at ULI and uh, led to a conversation and it grew into an opportunity to join our company. There are just so many opportunities for people of all ages to get involved as volunteers or just to attend the events and get involved. Great about ULI is if there's that someone you've been wanting to meet and you haven't had the opportunity to do so, the roster of members is open. Take a look at who the members are. If that person's on the list, ask one of the ULI staff and they will make the introduction. Conversations that are happening, everything from the technology side of the business and incorporating uh, you know, UTEC into development uh, and urban planning. That's rare to have that kind of um, an entity that can convene conversations from a whole variety of perspectives so that we can and a push and challenge each other to think a little differently about the solutions that might make a lot of sense. Now that I've been a part of ULI for seven years and then I volunteered for ULI, I, I hardly go by without going to an event and not knowing one person. And sometimes I actually find that um, there isn't enough time during the network portion of an event to talk to everybody that I know there. Join ULI to connect with people in the industry, to grow your career and to give back Good afternoon or good morning from wherever you are tuning in. I don't know about you, but watching that video made me a bit nostalgic for being together. Lots of my favorite people were in that video. I just want to begin by saying a little thank you, a little shout out to Alex Crystal, as well as to Richard for the exceptional work that they've done over the course of the past nine months, really keeping us all connected in a phenomenal way, delivering really timely and pertinent programming that I think continues to be the lifeblood of ULI Toronto. So thank you to the team in the Toronto office. And we're absolutely thrilled to be talking about neighborhoods today. My name is Jennifer Kiesmat. I am the former chief planner of the city of Toronto and a founding partner of Marquee Developments based here in the GTA. We're focused on building affordable rental housing. And I'm going to be your moderator today. I should also add I'm on the advisory board of ULI. I'm going to take you through the session, introduce you to our guests, and also take you through the Q&A at the end of the session. So really importantly, um, there's an opportunity to shape the conversation today. And I'll talk a little bit more about how you can get engaged in that as we move through um, the program. So this session is really a book launch. It is about neighborhoods for the future, confronting the post-pandemic global urban challenge. And today we will be examining one of my favorite topics, which is the effects of low density urban sprawl and how we can reverse this trend in order to make more livable and equitable communities. And really we're taking a global lens to this question based on this phenomenal book, uh, which I'm hoping all of you can access. Martin, you're gonna have to tell everyone where they can get it. Um, but this phenomenal book is the topic of our conversation today. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. As a Toronto region-based organization, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on virtually, and for some of you, this will be different depending on where you are located, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, 
the Anish Inwa Bay, the Chippewa, the Hayden No Saini, and the Wadenaw peoples. And now, today, Toronto is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and we are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land, and by doing so, we give our respect to its first inhabitants. We'd we'll also like to point out to you that there's an excellent program that ULI has hosted previously, which you can access. It focused on 13,000 years of Indigenous history in the GTA and why this history matters to planning and development. We highly recommend watching it. Uh, it's an education and it really gets at the meaning behind this land acknowledgement. You'll notice we've just dropped the link to that conversation in the chat. Please copy it and take a look at it later. Before we start, I'd like to begin by going through a few housekeeping items, things that you're used to. Uh, everyone, of course, will automatically be muted throughout the session to ensure that there are no audio interferences. Uh, ULIs become experts at doing this, so I think you'll see things go pretty smoothly. If you have any questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A function to upvote question by pressing the thumbs up vote, vote button. When we get to the Q&A part, Richard will be going through the questions. So making your little mark with your thumb is really valuable in helping us moderate that conversation. There is also closed captioning available. There may be a slight delay and it may not be 100% accurate. So please be patient uh, with us and with the technology. This session is also being recorded and will be sent to you following this session. So you can share it if you like it. If you want to take the conversation online, please do not hesitate to tag us with the handle at ULI Toronto or with the hashtag ask great questions. I'll now like to shift and begin with a really critical part of every ULI event is our appreciation uh, that we express to our sponsors. Today's event and all other ULI programming would not be possible without the support of our annual sponsors. And on behalf of ULI, I would like to thank them for their continued support. ULI Toronto relies on the support of our sponsors to provide quality programming and to drive our mission of creating and sustaining thriving communities. And as you can see, there's a great representation from organizations throughout the Toronto region that are a part of the sponsoring of the excellent program that you see at ULI. And to all of our sponsors, this wouldn't happen without you. So we say thank you. And thank you as well for sticking with us through the pandemic uh, as we've had to shift all of this online. Before we get into our speakers, I'd like to begin by, uh, by introducing to you through video, the Consul General of the United Kingdom of the Netherlands in Toronto. And this is Anne Lee Gulek. And she represents the Netherlands for the provinces of Ontario, Manitoba, and Nunavut. Together with her team in Toronto, the focus of the Consul General is to bring Dutch solutions to global challenges and to strive for optimal businesses and cultural relations between Canada and the Netherlands. And with that, I'll pass over the microphone to Anne for her remarks. Hello everyone, and welcome to you all in Canada and abroad. My name is Anne Le Gillek, and as you may know, I represent the Kingdom of the Netherlands here in Toronto. Um, together with my colleagues across Canada, in Ottawa and in Vancouver as well, we have the great mission to foster collaborations between our two countries, uh, share best practices and inspire each other. First of all, I would like to thank Richard, Richard Joy, thank you for inviting us to be part of this uh, webinar today. Uh, Yulai and the Consulate have been partners for many years, working on very inspiring projects and events uh, related to climate adaptation and resilience, resiliency. Guided by the Sustainable Development Goals, our economic diplomacy activities are focused on different themes. And one of them is pr trying to achieve more livable, walkable, bikeable, not sure if it exists, and sustainable and socially inclusive community in the world and in Toronto, of course. 
Uh, that's why I'm very happy to follow today's discussion about the neighborhoods transformation and uh, to learn from best practices from Canada, from the Netherlands and elsewhere in the world. I had the pleasure to meet most of the speakers on the agenda during my years here in Toronto and I look very much forward to continuing the dialogue after today and I really encourage partnerships. And I'm very happy that actually most of the speakers today are Dutch or have a Dutch name. I wish you all a beautiful uh, webinar, uh, thank you and hope to see you soon. Thank you so much Anne. Um, Maybe it's a coincidence, I don't know, that I have a Dutch name. I'm Dutch too, uh, but of course I'm Canadian through and through. I'm absolutely thrilled to shift gears from Anne's great opening comments to our two speakers who will be speaking to us today. And I'd like to begin by just setting the frame for this conversation because uh, Martin's book, Neighborhoods for the Future, A Plea for Social and Ecological Urbanism, this is a book launch, but in some ways it's, it's actually more than that. It's actually about pushing our thinking about how we reset our thinking about urban environments and urban places and the use of land in light of what's happened during the pandemic, but also in light of the multiple crises of climate change and the crisis of social equity that has become even more profound than any of us could have iman imagined and risen to the surface in the context of the pandemic. So this is actually a book launch and it's a conversation about the future of how we live in light of incredibly pressing challenges that demand we think about our profession in a fundamentally new way. So to set the frame with the book launch, let me begin by introducing to you Martin, uh, sorry, Martin Hayar, who is a distinguished professor, Urban Futures at Utrecht University. Martin is a distinguished professor and he has previously, sorry, I'm just having a little problem here with my notes, and he was previously the Dutch Cabinet Advisor on Spatial Planning as Director General of PBL. Now PBL is the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. He holds an MA degree in political science as well as in urban regional planning, as well as a PhD from Oxford University. I'll also just introduce right now a minute our second speaker, and then we'll kick right off into Martin's presentation. Our second speaker is Francis M. J. Hoban, founding partner and creative director of Mekanu. Her work ranges from theaters, museums, and libraries to neighborhoods, housing, and parks. Each design is founded on an observation of people, location, culture, and climate. And Francine is going to be bringing a distinctly international perspective to this conversation as well. After Martin and Francine's presentations, we're going to moderate a panel and I'll introduce the panel after the presentations. With this, I will turn the floor over to Martin for his opening presentation. Welcome Martin, we're thrilled to have you. Thanks, Jennifer. It's wonderful to be here and what an opportunity uh, ULI and the consulate have, have given us to, uh, to share with you uh, the work on, uh, on uh, neighborhoods. Um, um, it should not come as a surprise, I mean, uh, that we realize that we have to rethink how we make cities. Um, the Corona crisis perhaps is, uh, is something that is now in the forefront of our minds, but behind it are of course more formidable uh, questions that, uh, that Jennifer already uh, addressed. And now there are two flavors of people. Some say, well, to get to a solution, you have to make a problem simpler. And others say, no, no, no. If you really want to get a good solution, you have to make the problem more complex. And I suppose I am, normally uh, somebody who is in the latter category. So I like to, to connect issues to each other. And what we've done in this book is actually say, well, indeed, climate crisis, social inequality, these are the tremendous challenges of the 21st century cities. But mind you, there may be an obvious entry point, and that is to put the neighborhoods center stage. So that is what I would like to share with you in, in the 15 minute, minutes um, coming. 
I draw for this book and I, I, I wrote it together with Martijn, Peter Pelzer, uh, Edwin Buitelaar and Christian Dam. So it's really a team effort from the Utrecht University. I wrote this based on work that I did with another team of people for a UN panel, the International Resource Panel. And in this report uh, that came out in 2016, we calculated how much resources we need in order to facilitate the future urbanization of 2050. It should not come as a surprise to you that that is a formidable sum. And basically, if we continue to build the cities in the modern way that we've started to build them in the 20th century, we're just going to blow the fuses of the planet. It's as simple as that. So we have to change tech. And this was addressed hey, to a global audience. And that's what the UN is for. But I'm concerned that if we all discuss these environmental issues on the global stage, we miss the opportunity and we lack ultimately the legitimacy that we need from citizens, from people, urbanites living in these cities. So by putting the neighborhood back in the center, I'm not forgetting about this global sum, but I'm trying to show that we can indeed provide local solutions. I won't go into the details, but in this team, we had a mathematician called Serge Salat. And he said actually, precisely what I just referred to. He said, well, let's make the problem really complex and then see how far we get. And he calculated, and I think that that is, that is the ultimate legitimation for this approach. You should not think about just pedestrianizing Young Street or so. He said, think about the cultural effects of becoming more urban. Think about the new way in, in which you provide the heating. Think about the new way in which you connect services. And then you have a doubling effect, actually, he argued, and uh, that if we also change the urban layout, for instance, we can indeed make fantastically livable cities with a tenth of the resource requirements. So this is a can-do argument. I think also it is important to, to just realize that we know from from indeed from planning theory, urban planning theory, that if you try and persuade people with sums like the previous slide, you know, you don't get that far. You get very far with policymakers, perhaps people in business, but not, it doesn't get to a broadly shared coalition. For that, you need storylines. And I think that most people at the moment think that climate change has only bad news for them. That the environment is destroyed, biodiversity loss, and they will also have to pay for that whole energy transition. Therefore, it is crucial to have a positive narrative about our cities. And the building blocks are, I think, to make them green and just, of course, what you're also experimenting with in the Toronto region. But to make people realize how fundamental it is, I always say, well, look, what we are going to change in the next decades. We're going to rethink our energy sources, rethink our mobility, so the car based mobility, privatized, owned vehicles, very questionable if that's going to remain the same. Rethink shelter and rethink food. So these are the more fundamental categories of human life eh, we're discussing. So in that sense, it is important to then come up the solutions that are attractive to people. And I think in this neighborhood book, we argue don't try to think about individual solutions. Try to create a narrative of collective solutions. It's not about a dwelling. It is about that what is in between the private dwelling and the urban anonymity. And that, that in between, that is for us the neighborhood. What we did in this book, and it is, I was told, uh, now in the warehouses of Indigo, so it will be in the shop shortly. We have a very good uh, American uh, distributor and it should be in shops if they're open and on, otherwise, hopefully you can order it through your local bookstore. In this book, what we did, we followed the need to provide environmental cities and then combined it 
with the need to provide social, more socially just cities. And we do this by first of all pointing out, like we did in the uh, UN report, that we need to accept that we need to enhance and deepen our density commitments. But this is the classic comparison. You remember, and you've probably seen it uh, somewhere. Uh, Barcelona, same amount of people Atl as Atlanta, but an incredible smaller uh, CO2 uh, output uh, when it comes to transport. So while some of the neighborhoods that we will discuss, we will discussing are highly urban, the true challenge is of course to think, can we make true neighborhoods of the suburbs? And can we densify these suburbs and in a way that it is not taking quality away from people, but adding quality. And I suppose the good news there is that what we now see is really a proliferation of experiments, of discourses that do precisely that. So Anna Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, introduced the concept of the 15 minute city, arguing everybody should overall be able to reach whatever you want to reach within 15 minutes and not using your private car, but using bicycles, using public transport, uh, you, being a pedestrian. And she won an election. She won an election that was partly based on that commitment. So Paris is now going to push over the next couple of years, this 15 minute city. In Barcelona, another city with a, with a very high density, that high density of 22,000 people per square kilometer, like Paris, the Serda grid is going to be remade. The cars are going to be taken out of that grid and green is going to be reintroduced or I should say introduced of course, because in the Serda grid, it was pretty, pretty tough bricks that dominated the scene. So these cities, even Milan is trying to get away from cars. Well, Milan has a more of a car problem than Toronto. So it's really a car dominated city. You see all these cities trying to get away from it. And, then building blocks could be uh, our commitment uh, to, to neighbors. As I said, they are key, small enough to be tangible, but also big enough to scale, big enough to really make a difference when it comes to your climate change commitments. Now, here is a case from the, from the book. What we do, we have, we have a, a set of small examples like Hunziger Areal, and we have three deep case studies. And this one, I. I really like to share because this is a case in Switzerland, Zurich, where they said, well, if it's for fairness, we have to make a neighborhood that where every individual has as much energy consumption per head, so, so per head, as everybody in the world should be able to have and still commit ourselves to the climate uh, agreement. And then you think, well, they must be living in huts. There is nothing left, no, no luxury left, but this is what it looks like. Okay, these dwellings are smaller. Okay, these dwellings don't have washing machines individually. They, they don't have freezers, but they do have them, but in a, in a collectivized way. And they have committed themselves to public spaces that really work for them. Alas, of course, look at the building material. That's not exactly uh, 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 beyond concrete, but that's another, uh, another issue. Here is uh, Amsterdam, so the reuse of an old industrial district, GWL, where they have banned the cars from the whole, uh, from the whole neighborhood. The cars are parked on the outside and all, all spaces in between are collective gardens. They are not private gardens. So what we try and do analytically is to say, well, okay, in our push for these sustainability challenges, let's try and reconnect that work on CO2 emissions and, and post-fossil, let's connect it to the tradition of urbanism, the tradition of knowing what makes a good urban neighborhood that you know, goes way back to the Chicago school of the 1920s, of uh, Park and Burgess and others. And therefore we, we reintroduce this phrase of ecology to think about things that belong together to think about services and modes of exchange, material infrastructures that in their interaction make a neighborhood good. They have the argument that focuses upon how these things strengthen each other, not work against each other. And that ecology is what we try and analyze in all these different neighborhoods. Here's uh, Malmö 
wonderful uh, harbor development where they, they did extending work to reintroduce the biodiversity with very clever little uh, schemes. Now, I won't bore you with this slide, but we are academics, you know, we have to have an analytical frame. We say ultimately it comes down to four things. So you need to have a, a discourse, uh, the ideas or the narrative, as I earlier said, storylines. You need to think about the, the actors. And as we will be discussing, they are not necessarily, of course, the government. It's private, it's NGOs and their interaction. We found that that was absolutely crucial to explain successes in a, of the cases in the book and resources, financial uh, sustainability, and what we call a neighborhood value chain. How you can avoid that if a neighborhood becomes successful, prices go up and all the extra wealth is privatized, basically. How can you make sure that that can be reinvested uh, in, in uh, that very same neighborhood? And finally, these rules that provide for that. And we say simple rules, uh, are often to be preferred, but uh, Martijn can perhaps uh, say a bit more uh, about that in, in the discussion. So you get this sort of an environment. This is Vauban, an ecological neighborhood that is built by Baugruppen, collectives, where, where citizens have the right to be a project developer and leverage money from the banks. And uh, with incredible quality, but with also a cooperative structure. So that if they leave the, uh, the cooperative, the, the value of the, of the neighborhood remains in the cooperative. They're uh, uh, compensated financially, but they don't take away the gains. And here's your Regent Park. I won't discuss that, but let's, I will only say this about it, that for us coming from Europe, it was quite unique to see the level of finishing and to have this sort of a communal garden, which is social housing and is affordable and of course paid for by, you know, perhaps you can uh, say debatable, of course, by selling off the land. But I mean, there is just uh, no way in which you can create quality without uh, trade-offs. And that's what we became, uh, what we saw time and time again. So planning, and I'm sort of finishing uh, my introduction here, Planning for us is the, and that's a European argument, of course, it's not about accommodating, but really about shaping new aspirations, also for the suburbs. Taking seriously also the worry of people in the suburbs that say that density is bad for them, but not surrendering it, but showing by, by example, what these new areas could be like. Eh? So come up with the imaginary that people can appreciate by seeing it like happened of course in your case in Regent Park in a, in, a, in a highly urban neighborhood. We argue in the end that in a, a radical social mix is possible we saw it time and time again but crucially it seems to be and, and I'm really interested to see what, what we will be discussing in the in the webinar later on that, that that it is built on actors that have a continued skin in the game that do not go in and go out uh, with, with more money in their pockets, but that stay committed for 10, 20 or 30 years, preferably, on rules that keep created value within the neighborhood, as I explained, and on a strong shared public domain. Eh? So the service level of that neighborhood probably should have more attention than say the privatized space. And there's lots of sort of shifting lifestyle research going on that suggests that in the future indeed we can create these higher densities uh, if we prioritize the public domain. By the way, when I said Paris and Barcelona, that's really high density, 22,000 per square kilometer, but overall in the UN report we say that 11,000 per square kilometer is already quite, quite crucially good. And so it is not that it all has to be uh, like, like it is in, in Paris. So, as I said, we argue, take up that urbanist tradition while addressing these issues of climate change. Don't sectoralize climate change and don't sectoralize social justice. Keep them together because that creates ultimately the sort of good neighborhoods we need for our future. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin. I have to say that um, Boy, you packed a lot in there. And uh, for those who haven't yet had the opportunity to read the book, that was a really good snapshot of the magnitude of 
in some ways, the complexity of lenses that is brought to this question of neighborhoods in the context of the book. And one of the reasons why I loved it so much. And I really like the way you phrase the problem that we're, we're the, the challenge we're facing right now, which is that we're blowing out the fuses of the planet. Like it really puts a fine point on the, the urgency around the solution uh, that you've je- then walked through. And a little spoiler alert, um, our panel is going to be focusing on the case study of Regent Park, which is included in the book. And I have to say, for some reason, when I opened the book, it opened right to the Regent Park case study. And it was, it was you know, you put an international lens on reading it. I know the story from, from being engaged in it in the Toronto context, and I loved reading it through that international perspective. So we'll be coming back to Regent Park in the moderation. Before that, I'm thrilled for us to be hearing from Francine, and Francine is going to be tying in many of these themes that Martin has introduced into a broader international context. So Francine, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, let me see, do I share screen, yeah? Yes. Uh, Let me see how this... Perfect. Yeah, it's okay, yeah? We can see your slide, yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you for introducing me. First of all, I'm very happy to... uh, I'm not not happy. I'm not happy to be not in in Toronto because maybe, as you know, I I will talk about Rotterdam South, but maybe, as you know, we have also been working the last two years on Trinity College, where we on a small scale, on a smaller, smaller scale than a big neighborhood, really are talking about sustainability, but also food is very much part of the philosophy of the project we are doing there. But what I want to show you today is, um, I want to talk about Rotterdam South. And it was for me a kind of personal journey that I started now maybe four or five years ago. And I don't know how well you know Rotterdam, but it's a um, harbor city. So we have this big harbor uh, going to the, the river to the sea. And then uh, you have north of the river, that's Rotterdam North, and you have Rotterdam South. Um, and you can see that the harbor is and was very much part of the growing of the city. And you see it here, the, this picture is taken from the southern part of the city. If you compare the northern and the southern part, uh, there is almost no higher level of education in the south. Um, In the city of Rotterdam, 60% lives in the north, 40% in the south. That's 250,000 people, what is like for for in the Netherlands, uh, the size of a city. Um, The life expectancy in south is three years less than the rest of the city. Uh, there's 20% less disposable income per household than city average, and sports participation is uh, very low in this part, although they have the biggest park, even uh, city park in the Netherlands. Um, and for me, it was also strange because um, uh, Martin is talking about neighborhoods, and then I thought, you know, what is the scale of the neighborhood? But you have to realize this is, again, north and south and the river in between. But we call South just this whole neighborhood, <laughs> as this whole area, as, as almost one neighborhood is called South, although it has many, many different neighborhoods with different populations and different um, identities. And I was also thinking, you know, if you look at the map of Rotterdam, but even how it's connected in the Netherlands, there is no higher education below the river. The river is dividing North and South also with higher and lower education. And I was also observing, you know, these are these harbors, you know, they're very empty in the city. What are you doing with this? What is it? What should happen here? Also, I was amazed that if you see the link, uh, link, um, the left part is the harbor. Uh, There's 180,000 jobs. There's almost no public transportation. And they really trying to find people to work there. And next to it is Rotterdam South who has more than 200,000 inhabitants with a lot of people without jobs. You know, what's, what happened here? And also I was wondering, you know, if this is again, the map of Rotterdam, Northern part has 35 uh, subway stations and the South has only five. 
So I started to talk to everybody. So also very much bottom up, talking to people in the street, but also talking to bosses of the harbor or the boss of the city or the, you know, I, I was uh, with artists. I, I started and make a story and try to understand everything just by individual, me as a person talking to people. And then I remember I was on a Dutch, um, on a Dutch television program. I was there together with uh, um, ministers talking about energy transition and water management and new economy. And then I said, you know, and she and she, they were asking me, you know, what do you still want to do, Francine, in your life? And I said, I really want to make a plan of Rotterdam South and try to combine it with all these issues uh, uh, about uh, um, uh, energy transition and uh, water management and all these other issues. So I started. And um, I thought also I want to fear, try to bring the harbor and the city again together because for me it feels divided. And because it's areas that is always in transition, so past, present, and future, it's always in transition. I have, we have to prepare for that. Also, the, we have to be aware, sometimes people think that a harbor is a kind of natural thing. It's not. It's made because it was needed for a certain e e economy, but it used to be land. Uh, it, it's immigrants came in, in the southern part of, of the city, because they need workers for the harbor, for that economy. They made an urban plan that was as good as in the northern side of the city. Nothing wrong with this, you know, with beautiful water lanes and um, it's all okay. It was also very well connected to the harbor, even going, you had the ships, but also relaxing and, uh, and, and the beach. It was all in the harbor. Uh, they created a tunnel between the north and the south, also very much to get the people walking and biking between north and south. Um, then what happened in 53, we had the flooding of the Netherlands and what they had to do, and so here you see the flooding, but here you see it on the right hand side, this map, they made everywhere between the river and the harbor and the neighborhoods a dike. But the dike became really an obstruction between the neighborhoods and the harbor. How to deal with that? But also what happened is that the people who lived in the, these neighborhoods who were working in the harbor, the industry, the building industry became more interesting and paid better. So they moved more in the southern part of the south of Rotterdam and all the immigrants from Turkey and Morocco, they came into the city. Another thing what happened, mobility is very much part of the story. Uh, often where is a poor area there's also no there's also poor uh, mobility so they introduced the subway they just made five stations but they got rid of most of the public uh, public transportation by streetcars and then if you compare how these this part of the city was so well connected to the buses of the harbor uh, where they they felt they had to take care of the population it's not now anymore. There is a lot of uh, kids of the immigrants, maybe third, second or third generation. They have no connection with the harbor, even a negative connection because they thought, you know, it's dirty work. But the, the work in the harbor is really changing. It's not that dirty anymore. Um, the city, the harbor itself is getting their, their workers from all over the world, but they don't live in this neighborhood anymore. Not often, not anymore. So you can see Economically, the harbor is always in transition. It moved to the sea, but also the harbor of Rotterdam, you know, they have to be again prepared for transition. Also in this whole energy transition, what will change the, um, the work, what's happening in the harbor in an enormous way. And we did analyze, you know, who is still, uh, we, what kind of business is in the harbor? And we did find out that a lot of that it's totally not water related anymore. And it also felt that the harbor was almost a state in the state. They are not connected to, to the city, also not in an um, urban planning way. And we started to analyze who owns what land. And maybe it's the, the actors, like in, in the book of um, Martin. You know, who are the different landowners? Um, how can you deal with this? This is between harbor and the neighborhoods. 
you know, and how can we change that? How we can make this something productive that they get more connected and that it's positive for the harbor and the city. Hey, maybe it could become a, a, what we call a dike park, hey, a, a very long dike park, hey, where you can, what's good for health, it's good for exercise, it's good for biodiversity, it's good for heat stress, but it also brings more people um, together. And it is, would be 15 kilometers, kilometers long. And imagine that you have this whole dike park, dike park, I know this is an English word, <laughs> Uh, as a new statement of uh, uh, that uh, are now hidden behind the dikes. Another thing, what we said, what if this harbor is a little bit more in transition, that you also can start to make, become a little bit more mixed use, that to change the public space there, to get again how, it, how positive it can be, like you have in Toronto, that you can really also uh, use the water for... Um, for canoeing, for instance, um, but also bring education here. So we positioned here a whole campus with education, um, uh, more also higher education that works together with the, I don't know what, lower education um, as a campus and that we connected in mobility. We made this circle, is an existing bridge using the tunnel in a much better way. So you get a new circle in Rotterdam, but really brings together, that's really the heart of the city. It's Rotterdam as, and North and South together and very much linked to uh, education because the other campus is over here, the educational campus is on the Northern side of the city. Mobility plays an enormous important role is my opinion. Um, this is the map where we show the this is all the, uh, the subway stations, as I explained to you before. And for instance, on the right hand side is Metro Station Slingen. A lot of this, you know, it looks horrible and it's horrible, <laughs> I can tell you. It's just in between two neighborhoods. The two neighborhoods are really lacking um, identity, uh, good services. And this metro station, subway station, is used more as a parking lot so that people can park their car and then go. Uh, take the train to the um, downtown Rotterdam, for instance. But what if we said, if we make a new subway station somewhere here, uh, uh, we call it Waalhaven, but that gives us the possibility of development of this station to become really a heart of uh, these two neighborhoods uh, to add new housing, to add more services and better mobility becomes also a mobility hub. Again, also talking about mobility is this tunnel. It's a really nice tunnel. It's one of the icons of Rotterdam, but it's a lot of people don't use it anymore, but it's really, you can bike there, you can walk there. Um, but, and it has, it's also for cars. And we, and we said, you know, imagine that you put um, a, a, a metro does not fit underneath that tunnel now, but imagine that we make a kind of super bus that connects north and south and links it to the Waalhaven and to other areas. And also be aware that mobility is changing and take this part of the city also make it part of it. So you get this, what I call the, and this is almost my last slide, the super bus routes through the mass tunnel, because otherwise a lot of planning around mobility takes like five years or 10 years or maybe 20 years. No, you should do it now. It's existing neighborhoods. They need more mobility and, and a super bus is also more um, flexible. So, and, um, so we made a whole proposal of, um, of, of, of a new mobility uh, uh, system in, um, in Rotterdam. So, and I also draw, this is the drawing I made, um, I called it a new perspective on South. And new perspective was for me for many reasons, also drawing it from the side of the harbor, but also giving new perspective for the young generation in the neighborhoods of Rotterdam. And that it becomes a beautiful city behind the dikes, I mentioned it. I did, I, I think I worked like four years on this idea, yeah, step by step, um, to integrate. And I think that's very important to think also on a bigger scale, yeah, dike and water management, social and work opportunities, bring mobility and this tunnel together, greening the city, the energy transition. Also be aware that 
you know the um, the knowledge economy it's you know it's economy knowledge economy is a very big issue where education should be very much linked to it and the maker industry and i presented these plans i think now a year ago and i said and maybe that's also what 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 uh, martin calls the actors i need many many actors um different the different schools the different universities um, the scale of the city, but also the scale of the province, what we call um, people producing the energy, the Dutch railroad system, and they all, or even the water management system of the uh, thing, and they all love it. So they really, I said, you know, you should not think what's in for me, but what's in the city and the region as a whole. And we're really making um, big steps now by this idea because people love it. So now I'm working on a bigger map. And they, the city of Rotterdam uses it as an idea to get a, a vision on the future of this part of the city. We're also working out, out this idea about the dikes. Could that really be possible to get a, a 15 kilometer linear park in this city? And, and also that my idea is to keep on going, to go into the neighborhoods, um, to tell and give perspective to um, to also the young generation, we want to connect to the schools, to the young generation of um, of the of the yeah, of Rotterdam South. And what I also learned, uh, because I now give you gave you a short presentation, people love that there is a history behind their neighborhood, uh, and it gives them also a proudness and um, and to combine it with all these. Um, issues what Martin is uh, telling in his book eh, also about ecology and energy transition and uh, water management don't forget the water management in the Netherlands it some, becomes something positive and it gives you opportunities and uh, so it makes people um, gives perspective and it gives a kind of happiness is this okay for now <laughs> so I'm still working on it this is excellent. And it's, um, it's thrilling to see the work that you're doing, Francine, and the way that you've brought together very detailed themes that exist in, um, in, in Martin's book, including this question of who owns the land, but then also mobility. And I love that we went through some very sweeping uh, big themes, and then you showed us a very practical application of those of those themes. And we're going to take that even one step farther. You talked about how there's many actors that are required in order to evolve a place and evolve a neighborhood. And in keeping with that theme, we're going to turn to the case study that Martin has in his book, Neighborhoods for the Future, A Plea for Social and Ecological Urbanism. And that is our own Regent Park. And we've invited two community members, including representative from Daniels, along with one of the book's co-authors who Martin mentioned in his presentation, also conveniently named Martin. And we're going to walk through a series of questions with our um, with this panel. So I'd like to just take a second and introduce the panel. I don't wanna to spend too much time on introductions because I know that you're anxious to hear some of their commentary specifically. And the first person I'd like to introduce is Surya Ibrahim. And Surya is a supervisor at Community Connections at the Center for Community Learning and Development. She has been involved in many community development projects, including the Regent Park Catering Collective, which has catered for more than 300 events and created income generating opportunities for over 65 Regent Park residents. Uh, Surya, uh, welcome to our panel. It's great to have you here today. I'd also like to introduce Hele uh, uh, Omar Kayel. And Hele is the president of social impact at Daniels. And what's really interesting about her role is that she really bridges a very traditional development organization and bringing in and ensuring the social, cultural and economic infrastructure is being built as part of a traditional really development model. And she has been involved in Regent Park since 2009, um, working on its re redevelopment. So lots of history there as well. And then of course, to round 
out the panel, we're going to bring one of the other co-authors co of the book into the conversation, Martin Van Den Herk. And Martin is an assistant professor of spatial planning at Utrecht University. He is one of the co-authors of the book, and he pre previously conducted research at the University of Amsterdam, the University of Antwerp, as well as the University of our very own University of Toronto. So what I'd like to do is begin with some very high level questions and I'll ask each of the panelists uh, to, um, you can be broad in how you think about answering these questions. They're kind of overarching to give you a little bit of room to go where you would like. Um, but I'd like to start by making this kind of personal because neighborhoods are all about relationships. They're about who we are and who we are becoming, um, both as individuals, as a community, and as a broader society. So maybe in the order that I introduced you, I'd like to begin with um, just hearing a story or an example from your life of a way that your neighborhood influenced and possibly even if we can go so far as to say, changed you. And why don't we begin with Saria? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Jennifer. And I wanna say thank you for, this is amazing book. Um, so when I see my, when I saw my neighbor and when I saw my name, so oh, this is so global village, but you hear about it, but when you see your neighbors and I've been some of the city that the Switzerland and stuff, but oh my God, this, oh, it feels so good. And having uh, your neighbor been uh, put it there, um, uh, you did it very well. Uh, I wanna say thank you for that. Um, oh my, um, Regent Park is, oh God, the neighbor that shaped me who I am. Um, uh, in a way um, that I never thought that I will have that kind of uh, love for my neighbor. So I went, I wanna take you back. And a couple of years ago, I could say about 15 years ago when I went back home and I'm sitting back home with my mom and I missed Regent Park. And I said, this is my community. So I spent my whole life, adult life more than back home. Um, so this is where uh, I will say home. Uh, this is my community. So, um, so it shapes me in so many ways and take, took initiatives um, where I put my voice, my sorrow, um, share meals um, and um, fight so many battles, I, I would say, um, with a lot of stakeholders, uh, which is that this is my community. Um, this is what I wanna see happening. This is my people. Um, this is what we want. Um, that's where uh, community is. Um, so we'll shape you in a way that you wanna be protective to your neighbor. You wanna be protective to your people. Um, so um, I, I would call that's the neighbor, that's the community. So you will share your meal. You will know your neighbor who is who. Um, you will be there when they need you. Um, and uh, despite I'm working in the neighborhoods, that's not what I feel. I feel this is my community. This is where I belong. This is where um, I need to uh, put my voice to be heard. Um, this is what we want. This is where uh, the line needs to be drawn. Um, so it's, it, there is emotion throughout the year that I build up that sometimes um, you cannot read it in a book, but it just builds up and as you grow up um, and as adults, uh, we carry a lot of emotion. We became so many uh, layer of us and we want to be protective of our community. Um, I don't want to take off so much time, but I get uh, so emotional and uh, I love where I live. So, yeah. Wow. What a, be what a beautiful... I love what Francine, the way she put the neighborhood and the way she visualized and putting it together. And I say, wow, that is the vision that we need moving forward. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I love both how passionate you are about it, but also that you, um, you talked about, it's the place where you fought your battles as well. You know, it's not, it, that's part of, and you use the word belonging and belonging. And I think those are really important themes 
um, that we'll probably come back to when we talk a minute about social infrastructure. Um, Hela, tell us a little bit, um, do you have an experience of a neighborhood that's been transformational? Uh, for sure, I think, you know, Soraya and I probably have uh, similar perspectives on neighborhood at, and it makes sense because we both uh, live in Regent Park. Um, I certainly haven't spent as much time here uh, as Soraya, but I did grow up in a very similar uh, social housing neighborhood in North York. Um, and like Regent Park, incredibly diverse and vibrant. Um, and one of my strongest memories is just, you know, after dinner, all of the families in the neighborhood would go out with the moms sort of sitting on the hill and the kids playing in the playground, sharing tea and pastries um, and foods from all around the world. And so that really shaped my understanding of neighborhood being about people and social networks uh, versus strictly about buildings. Um, and one of the most incredible sort of experiences for me was, you know, in my probably first year um, working in Regent Park, uh, I met with a group of quilters from the community. Um, this was a group of women who were making quilts and sewing. Um, and we commissioned a piece for uh, one of our condominium lobbies uh, to purchase a quilt as a piece of art. And so in working on this quilt, they were using old photos. And so it sort of uh, representing those photos in fabric. And one of the photos showed a bunch of the mums on a bench with tea while the kids were on the swings and automatically sort of took me back um, to my upbringing. And so, you know, when I decided to buy my first uh, place, I naturally chose Regent Park because it very much felt like home. Mm, fantastic. I've seen that quilt. It's absolutely um, breathtaking, but I love it that it has like a stronger kind of allusion to you for your for your childhood. Um, Martin, tell us, um, you know, a neighborhood that has shaped you uh, in some way. Well, uh, I'm, of course, impressed by the stories we, we've just heard. Um, very moving and very beautiful answers by, by uh, Hila and, and Saria. Uh, allow me to bring in a, a bit of a lighter note here. Um, I've had the luck to, to be living in Toronto for a couple of months, uh, a couple of years back. And what I remember fondly of, of living there somewhere between uh, Bloor Street and College Street was, you know, uh, this whole routine of, you know, where to find my coffee today? Where should I go? Where should I go for my, for my daily run, for my exercise? What should I do? Uh, where to find my new book. And I found that very enriching because it enriched me, I think, as a person. And I took great pleasure in that. It hasn't changed me as such, but I took great pleasure in being able to tell Torontonians about the stuff they should do and things where, to, where they should go to. Um, it made me kind of proud in a way. Um, and... Uh, I think they also appreciated me indulging in, in, in my own neighborhood that much. Um, so I, I think that would be my answer. It hasn't changed me at all. Uh, but when I was living there, it kind of formed me in a way. Ah, oh, very nice. So what I like here is we've actually had three very different stories. And one of the reasons I wanted to begin with this question is because the subtitle of this book is a plea for a social and ecological urbanism. And we know those two things are fundamentally linked. If we look at the city of Toronto's resiliency plan, um, one of the key indicators of whether a community will survive any kind of trauma or shock is the extent to which people know each other, the extent to which there's connections in the neighborhood. I think that um, you've begun to hint in all of your comments towards what, some of what this might look like, but I'd like to, I'd like to understand in your experience, what is foundational to creating strong social infrastructure? And I'll, whoever wants to go can just, uh, can just go first. We'll open up the discussion. I'll, I'll jump in here and I'll, I'll connect it back uh, to the book. I mean, it's very much been my experience in Regent Park and it's, it's one of the things that's really highlighted um, in the case study. Um, and that's that, you know, a lot of the community planning principles 
uh, came directly from the community. Um, the initial Regent Park development in the 1940s and 50s was very top down um, and focused on buildings and taking out the roads. Um, so very heavily on physical infrastructure. Um, and this time around the focus was, okay, you know, before I think Ken Greenberg said the line in uh, the interview, you know, before a line was even put on a piece of paper, let's talk to the neighborhood. Um, and that really, you know, I think informed the importance of a social uh, infrastructure, things like having uh, capacity building and employment opportunities for local residents, uh, spaces like parks, community centers, an arts and cultural center. We know these are also physical infrastructure pieces, but they're absolutely key to developing the social fabric of the neighborhood. Um, and then making sure that there are, um, you know, retail amenities and, you know, the first bank, the first grocery store, the first coffee shop. So places where people are not only finding employment opportunities, um, but what we hear in the neighborhood, that term of informal collisions. Um, and so to me, you know, social infrastructure is not simply about you know, programming and events. It's how do we create uh, the spaces and the opportunities for people to come together, build those networks and really enhance their quality of life, whether that's economic development or social capital. So that was so well said. Let me just flip this around a minute and ask the question, which is in some ways the counterpoint, which is um, what's the threat to that? When we look at the, we look at 21st century cities, we look at this moment that we're in in history, um, both uh, Martin and Francine talked a little bit about ownership and, you know, who owns the spaces and the buildings and the places in the city. What, what do you see, um, and maybe I'll direct this question specifically to you, Martin, what do you see as the greatest threat to the long-term viability of cities at the scale of the neighborhood? And in particular, the threat to that social infrastructure, that kind of real sense of place that made it, you know, a memorable experience to figure out where to get your coffee every day. Right. Um, um, let me throw in what I think is the grand challenge here. Uh, and that was probably the trigger to writing this book, which is, I think, climate change. And, um, in, you know, this, this climate change, forces us to make several transitions. And in the Netherlands, for instance, it's this energy transition. We have to go off the natural gas grid and stuff like that. Um, now, let me now connect to, to your question. Um, I think if there is one window in which you could like meaningfully and, and boldly improve neighborhoods, for instance, neighborhoods that are struggling, it is right now. So. If you want to do it the right way, what is probably needed is a uh, like a, an overhaul of neighborhoods that incorporates not only uh, that energy transition, but also very much what is on people's minds, the social infrastructure, right? So um, many people who are living in certain struggling neighborhoods, and we, we have many of them in the Netherlands as well, they have other things on their mind than the energy transition. I mean, they can barely pay their energy bills. Um, what I think is a great threat here is that we approach these neighborhoods, try to make them, uh, try to let them make this energy transition and then forget the whole social infrastructure underneath it or that surrounds it. Uh, and this is, for instance, happening in one of the neighborhoods that is starring in our book as a special in-depth case, I would say. There is a neighborhood in Utrecht. It's called Overvecht. Um, if there is one place where all these challenges come together, like poor public health, uh, high crime rates, high unemployment rates, uh, it's that place. And then this is going to be the neighborhood that's going to be a pioneer in the energy transition. And what happens right here, you're just focusing in a siloed way on making the energy transition. Uh, and that worries me. Uh, because there is a social infrastructure over there. It may be latent. Uh, it may not be visible for people who are working in City Hall. It is visible, though, for residents. It is visible for uh, uh, street-level bureaucrats. Um, there is a mismatch over there. And I think what my greatest worry is that we 
um, fail to make that connection between the social renovation that needs to be made and the ecological re renovation. I think that's my biggest fear. Mm, this is so interesting because I think part of what you've done in the book so well is actually weave together there was all of those interrelationships and sometimes we pursue one kind of change at the expense of another. Um, Soraya, do you want to weigh in on this question of the, the threat to neighborhoods? So I'm so glad that you mentioned, uh, Martin. Um, yes, poverty, of course. Um, sometimes the people who are making decision are they don't have lived experience that could uh, have impact in the community. Um, and another threat is racism. Um, and that it caused mental health um, that uh, in the age of uh, anti-black racism, I think a lot of industry realized that that and in, in chain making a change that needs um, that could have mental, if you are not well and being impacted by racism, you cannot be in function in the community or broader aspect of life. Um, so I think a lot of industries realizing that and changing the way they conduct um, and everything, and then also in the community level, if you see graffiti and go back home, that it caused a lot of mental health to the, the newcomers or the, to the black communities that they don't feel sense of belonging. Um, so that doesn't mean it is not gonna happen in Region Park. It did happen, but we do speak about it and we do address it in a way that we need a ch demanding a change that is not okay. Uh, seeing a racism comment and re seeing a noose hanging and a school and construction site, all of that, we, we do speak about it. We demand the change and, and, and we, we have a great stakeholders. Those also being addressed in broader aspect of in hiring inclusive uh, and having an anti-black racism framework and training the employee that to look at it in a way that what is inclusivity means. Or is that is a certain people could benefit from uh, the uh, the wealth that is coming to the community? We need to look at it in a broader aspect of it, having inclusive uh, framework, anti-black racism framework. And when we do that, that's where we all successful. It's not certain groups that will be successful and the other being left behind. And we talk about poverty reduction in the city of Toronto, but we have to do it in practical stuff. We just we label it that is the champion piece of it but when it comes to practical we need to make ourselves accountable and move on if we need to grow as a community level or a city levels we need to look at it that way as well so this is actually a really great segue um, into the one of the questions um, in the question board here about social equity i'm going to pass this over to richard who's going to moderate the q and a but I think it also links into, you know, the last the last kind of theme here, which is our hope moving forward. And I think the hope is the recognition of the magnitude of those social inequities and what happened with Black Lives Matter really put a focus on this in such a substantial way that um, reorienting how we think about transformation is at the fore of our imaginations right now. Richard, I'll, I'll pass the uh, podium to you. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Um, first of all, I'll just say right off that the top voted question was really more of a compliment, but but it it, it starts off with saying that we don't typically learn in planning school is how important it, uh, it is to be a good storyteller, um, and both of the speakers exemplified um, that uh, particularly well. Is the comment that got a lot of votes, and I think that's a nice uh, nice place to start. But I will pick up on that on that issue of of gentrification, and maybe even. Um, if we could have our, our um, presenters uh, come back in, if you could put your cameras on, because I'd like to get your thoughts on this as well. But it's the uh, consideration around gentrification um, that, that, that a lot of these projects um, potentially present, um, and, and including right here in Toronto, the Regent Park example. Um, as you're bringing more and more market into the mix, um, how do you, you know, mitigate um, the, the, the upward economic pressures that, that potentially could be very negative to the longer standing residents. I don't know. Uh, Martin Heyer, maybe, uh, and Francine, if you want to jump in on this, and then get some comments from the others. That, that might be our only question. And if that is our only question, I have, I have uh, 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 a good message for you all. So go ahead, Martin. 
Uh, thanks, Richard. Um, I mean, this is, of course, to the point. Eh? And, and, and when we discuss things like the uh, neighborhood value chain, what we want to do is avoid uh, uh, gentrification effects to the detriment of the quality of the neighborhood. Having said that, though, I think that uh, uh, adding expensive housing to a neighborhood can be an, an element of a, a good neighborhood revitalization strategy as uh, a regent park uh, proof, I suppose. And I mean, but the rules of a right of return and a, and a material a right of return in the sense that it is not, you know, at, at an increased cost and so forth, you know, they belong to controlling gentrification. So um, all over the world, in, uh, we've been building these modernist neighborhoods. They are very rich on, on space. So there's a lot of merit in exploring strategies to add fabric there, to create a, a better sense of community, but also to do something about the social mix. Is that gentrification? Probably there will be cappuccino uh, for sale and so forth, but it does not necessarily have to drive out other stuff. You can control it, but you have to make sure, of course, that if, for instance, in, 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 in your shops and so forth, the rent control system is somewhere. I, I mean, if rents are just, you know, can go up and down, then it will, will falter. But in the Netherlands, we have also uh, strips where, where there is a foundation that, that, the, that uh, controls the rents of, of shops. But these sort of in, in between rule systems can really help to avoid um, these, these mishaps. Francine, do you want a quick, quick comment on that? Uh, maybe I could add something what I did try to do with Rotterdam South because there was also, of course, also this discussion, but what they tried to do and also somebody asked in the in this Q&A about Afrikaanderweg, there was a philosophy to demolish parts of the neighborhood so that you put out people who have no jobs. <laughs> Uh, but what I try to do to add things that it's oh, and that and give perspective. Also, these people they want jobs, the children want jobs. So I wanted to I focus very much on creating jobs, creating a, a new economy to the, to make the transition to a new economy, and and link it to to these people. Uh, and then you can add uh, also what Martin is saying. You can add also new housing, new education, new, a new. Um, um, that also the change of the jobs and then you make a, a very strong neighborhood that gives perspective because why I did this because I felt that in urban planning it was very much often almost money driven by developers who are doing certain plots mm -hmm. and that's I said yeah but I try to make a level that's it's over this <laughs> and then people can go back to the plots mm -hmm. you understand that you know it's otherwise yeah uh, but I think so. I think so. Much more an, a perspective on economy, on jobs, and new jobs is, I think, very essential for a neighborhood. Surya, thank you, uh, Surya. I'm going to give you the last word just just as we as we really are out of time here, so 30 seconds. But as somebody who's sort of uh, lived through the before, during, and after, and then the after is still an unfolding story, of course. Um, what's your perspective on on that that question of of, of gentrification or the compatibility of bringing in the market uh, a component into into the neighborhood, the traditional neighborhood? It's it's a process. I would say uh, the people who are want to invest in the neighborhood, like Region Park, some of them they wanna be a part of diversity, but at the same time they have a good intention. Those intention good is not enough sometimes. We need to have that dialogue that we have. We need to have a space to share um, our um, common goals for the neighborhood, our common wishes for the neighborhood. What is acceptable, what is not acceptable. And we need to create a space that could bring everybody's together um, that could help um, uh, overcome the challenge. Everybody, all of us who are fa we are facing is not certain peoples. Um, it is a process. It's not, the community is not Thank perfect. You. It's the process, yeah. Thank you. And I um, I know that uh, some of the panelists are gonna try to quickly jam in uh, an answer on the, on the Q&A function as a way of answering some of the unanswered questions. But I will say that, that we will grab these questions and they will inform future uh, programming. So um, please, these are important things, uh, important inputs for us. Um, so sorry that we couldn't get through all the questions. Um, as Martin said at the very beginning, at the very top, uh, 
you know, sometimes it's good to ask a simple question, sometimes ask a more complex question. I think what we've learned is there is a lot of complexity. Of course, we all knew that. Um, and I think this was an example of just how so many things are interconnected. And this, this, this panel, I think, and this book launch is really, I think, a perfect uh, opportunity for us to, as we get out of the cloud of COVID, um, to, to return to thinking about these complex challenges uh, with sophisticated and on-point solutions. So I want to uh, quickly uh, uh, do a quick uh, uh, little uh, ad in, in the 30 seconds or so that I have here. A slide should be coming up right now. Um, very excited to announce that an international partnership between the Government of Canada, UN Habitat, and the Urban Economy Forum, UEF, was announced in November of 2020 to create a Regent Park World Urban Pavilion. The pavilion will act as a physical and virtual knowledge exchange hub to share best practices, innovation, and research in urban development and revitalization from the countries from countries around the world, including the implementation and promotion of the UN Sustainable De uh, Development Goals uh, and the new urban agenda. And the pavilion will open later this year, and I think ULI is going to play a significant role in part of that opening. So we're very excited about that. Um, and now, just to close out, I want to thank all of our participants uh, and all of you who are joining us. I want to thank our speakers uh, uh, and, a thank and Jennifer, uh, Martin, um, Francine, Saria, Hila, and Martin. Um, and special thanks to the Consulate of the Netherlands for being our partner in this program. And I know that you're in your final weeks in Toronto, and I wish you all the very best uh, in your future work. So great to have uh, intersected with you during your tour uh, here in Toronto. Um, and with that, I wish uh, everybody a happy uh, rest of week and into a long weekend. Um, well deserved. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.